Well, let's start by talking about carbohydrate intake. It seems we're all ingesting way too many carbohydrates. And this is what's driving metabolic disease in the form of obesity, inflammation, insulin resistance, diabetes, and lots more besides. So can we uh, start by just getting your take on this, first of all? I definitely think we're eating too many carbohydrates. I think it also goes beyond carbohydrate. I, th I think the whole driving of metabolic disease is broader than just carbohydrates. But if we want to start with carbohydrates... Um, I'm your girl because I'm a real advocate of um, whole food carbohydrate reduction for most of the population, really. Would you go so far as to say that you would be a proponent of the ketogenic approach or is that label a, a step too far, possibly? Is it just the case of, look, it's low carb and let's not put labels on it? You know, I, I think that's probably the, the, the crux of the whole story. And if we were probably a little bit more gentle, if you like, in our approach and our terminology, I think the critics wouldn't be critics and um, there'd be a lot more people aligned with the approach. So I'm a firm believer that if you have insulin resistance or hyperinsulinemia or related conditions, the low carb space is a really good space to sit in. I do work with clients um, using the ketogenic approach, but I, I think that to be in nutritional ketosis, to have high circulating ketones at the level of the brain for therapeutic action, having having neurological conditions or brain-related perturbations, I guess, would be the best use of the ketogenic diet. Now, certainly if someone with type 2 diabetes wants to go on the ketogenic diet, by all means, I'm not going to stop them. Or I might stop them, but um, if they're going to stick to it, I'm not going to stop them. But I think the biggest problem with keto, so to speak, is that it's, it is pretty extreme. It's really severe. And um, anyone can do it <clears throat> for a month, but not anyone and everyone can do it for, for, for lifelong. So um, I, th I think that that's the crux of it. I think if we push people towards keto and, you know, that even that word um, gets people's bristles up really, um, I, I think we might be doing their and the academic and practitioner community a disservice long term. So we just, it, it's not like I'm anti-keto at all. We just need to be very clear about which population groups we think are certain to low-carb and keto. And I also think that terminology is key. And, you know, it, about 10 years ago, we talk about um, low-carb, low-carb. And low-carb has become a, oh, it's just a, it's just a fad, low-carb. So we kind of move to a more sort of medical, academic term, carbohydrate restriction. Um, and it seemed to kind of lift the level a little bit in certain people's eyes. And now we're moving towards carbohydrate reduction because the word restriction um, implies exactly that. And, and while it is restriction, I think the word carbohydrate reduction is, is gentler. So it's about how we pitch these ideas to to the wider world in terms of how they accepted. But um, to get back to the, the root of your question, I sort of sit for most of my patients in the, in the carbohydrate reduction, low carb space. And if there are clients that um, don't fare as well as they want to fare in that space, or I've got clients with more severe neurologically related conditions, I would work with them in the ketogenic space. I spoke with uh, Dr. Dom D'Agostino, who is very prevalent in that uh, keto therapeutic space. Uh, I spoke to him the other day and he, he was talking uh, about the same thing, about it being very difficult to stick with if you're doing it just purely from a lifestyle standpoint, because it, it's so low in, in carbohydrates, whereas it's very effective, uh, as you said, in relation to some uh, neurological uh, disorders. Uh, I, I know it has a history of uh, being used to treat epilepsy, for example, the, the the ketogenic diet. But there seems to be also that stigma attached to to that keto word, which triggers people, as you mentioned already. And I think that probably that stigmatization does uh, that whole low carb movement a disservice as well, because I think people probably yeah. misunderstand what keto is and what low carb is, and they stigmatize the whole lot. Hundred percent. And the other thing that um, that goes hand in hand with when you suggest keto, people think, and, and rightly so, the original ketogenic diet for, um, for epilepsy application 
was very low in carbohydrate and very, very high in fat, and particularly saturated fat. So that initial definition of the ketogenic diet for therapeutic epilepsy has carried over. So people think that, oh, if I want to lose weight or reverse my type 2 diabetes, I've got to literally like cut it all out in terms of carbs, and I've got to pour cream on everything. I've got to put MCT and butter in my coffee in the morning, um, and I've got to eat cheese and bacon until the cows come home. And you know and that for some people that can be totally fine and not problematic, but I think for other people that it can be problematic. I think the area of lipidology is is an area of science that we don't know enough about to um, to make hard and fast rules with confidence. But we, we're getting to know um, a lot more, um, and and the whole LDL kind of. Um, the era of, of LDL cholesterol it being <laughs> being bad for you and causing well cardiovascular disease that is it's more nuanced than just um, you know the old diet heart um, and lipid hypothesis. So we we are understanding a lot more, but we, we're not there yet. And I'll just give you a classic example of um, so I work at AUT as a, a researcher, and we we've got this government funding for well, three years to. Um, to do implementation science in primary care, which is our doctor's doctor's clinics, looking at pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes and looking at a better way to deliver health care for these individuals and communities. Um, and I- implementation science, for those who might not know, is it's very different from a, a controlled trial where you come on a, you know, you come on an intervention for 12 weeks and you have a control group and everything's very set and you measure it before and after and it's, it's very... Um, very clinical and clear cut and well controlled. Implementation science is when you try something um, in a real life setting, a medical community setting, and you evaluate it as it goes along, um, and you modify as you know accordingly as it goes. So we're looking at after some um, evaluation with some people we work closely with, some some doctors, we are looking at implementing. Um, a carbohydrate reduction, whole food-based approach using he- the health coach approach, so using health coaching and community support initiatives in the primary care setting done either by GPs, health coaches, nurses, dietitians, whoever, which is a very, very different model. And um, we're kind of trying to move from the pharmaceutical model to the lifestyle medicine model um, and uh, medication reduction and reversing type or remitting type 2 diabetes um, and pre-diabetes is the, is the goal. And it's really interesting having conversations with the medical teams and he's like, oh, it's keto, not interested. And suddenly when they when they really begin to understand and upskill um, on what it's actually all about, it's just eating whole food. And if you truly eat whole food, it will probably end up being much lower in carb, slightly high in protein, and um, probably slightly higher in fat than the kind of traditional guideline, guidelines, but better quality. And once they begin to understand that you don't need to ship in caramels of cream by the dozen, then, you know, they start coming around and go, well, actually, that's a really good model. I'm in. So we started off by talking about high levels of overconsumption of carbohydrates uh, based on uh, uh, consuming a, a highly processed diet, uh, which was very, very heavy in the, as those uh, carbohydrates. So... The result of that was a metabolic dysfunction. We're talking obesity. We're talking diabetes. We're talking uh, insulin resistance, inflammation. Uh, these are the the general conditions that are, are a direct result of too much carbs. Would that be the, the right analysis? Whether it's the result of too much carbs, um, which which indicates that it's causal, uh, that's I don't think that is settled in science yet. But I, I think there are a lot of things that might contribute to insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia. But certainly we know that when you are in those contexts, then the management of them is, is um, best applied by a reduction of carbohydrate. I think there would be a lot of people that would say that high carbohydrate diets, poor quality high carbohydrate diets have resulted and led to these conditions. Um, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be brave or bold or stupid enough to pin it on that exactly, but I, I certainly think that, that it has a it has a, a hand to play for sure. 
What are the other contributory factors then do you think underpinning metabolic disease if it's not exclusively at the, that uh, huge increase in carbohydrate consumption that we've seen in recent decades? I think that ultra processed foods, and this is a big buzzword at the moment, um, but it, it it is true that ultra processed foods are contributing to to chronic disease in a massive way. And the interesting thing is, you might, you know, you, your listeners might be thinking, well, ultra processed foods means high carbohydrate foods anyway with lots of sweets and, you know, biscuits and everything. But it's not necessarily just carbohydrate that formulates an, an ultra processed food. So it's the it it's the it's the process itself um, that can contribute to, to some of the gut microbiome dysregulation and some of the hormone dysregulation that you get inside the body. Um, so some of the processes, some of the additives. Um, so it's the industrial manufactured process that manipulates food or what was once known as food into food like substances or items um, that is that is definitely contributing in some way to metabolic dysfunction. But I also think you know nutrition is is just one piece of the puzzle. But, you know we hear the, we hear these stories, we see these stories every day of people who, Eat terribly, um, but they live to to you know late nineties. And then you hear of those people who are just you know absolutely beautiful eaters. Everything's organic and natural, and and then um, they had some terrible disease earlier. So th- there's there's more to it. And I, I certainly think that um, the lifestyle in a general sense is important. So exercise, movement, general movement, um, resistance exercise, particularly for females. Um, is, is very important, but I think that one of the biggest um, one of the biggest things is stress, um, and also sleep is in there as well. But I think you know sleep you can sleep you can measure. And everyone's got these Fitbits and um, garlands and um, aura rings and devices that can measure sleep. But stress is that kind of insidious uh, variable that you can't really measure. You can't get a blood measure and go, "Whoops, I need to do something about this." So. I think stress kind of cre- creeps in, into people's lives in such a way that they don't realize it until either someone points it out or until it's too late. And, you know, stress is not all that bad. Acute stress, like that adrenaline rush before you do a, a presentation to a group of people or before you um, you run the 100 meters at the Olympics or something, that, that stress is, that hormetic stress is, is really important. But it's when it crosses over into chronic stress that's the that's the that's the problem and i think stress has a an enormous role to play but i'm not sure of the intricacies and what happens internally um but i'm convinced that's the killer if you enjoyed that video i know you'll get some value from this video right here